I heard a lot of good things about Hatch and the things you guys are trying to do here. Um, quick intro on me, I work at Wall Einhorn and Trinitzer. It's a CPA firm, she's actually next door. Um, we deal a lot with business owners and the businesses that they run, and so we help them manage uh, cash flow, help them with the tax planning, help them with uh, exit planning and some other things. Um, technically, I'm an attorney by trade. Um, after law school, I practiced law for a little bit in uh, business law, estate planning, some bankruptcy, and then uh, got tired of wearing a suit, so I went to a CPA firm, and uh, now I do a lot of tax consulting, tax preparation, that kind of thing. Um, I like working with a CPA firm more because I feel like I have a better pulse on the on our clients' businesses because we know the cash that's coming in, we know a lot of the transactions that are happening versus being a lawyer where we were brought in on a transaction just to do the paperwork and sometimes the details have already been ironed out or um, you know the, the, we didn't have a lot of uh, upfront information we could help the client with. And so uh, I appreciate that. So today we want to talk a little about, about crowdfunding and particularly <coughs> the the accounting side of, of crowdfunding and some things that we need to look out for. Um, there are really four um, four types of crowdfunding. Definition obviously is you're asking a lot of people to help you raise capital um, and so you can start a business essentially or provide a service. Um, you're probably familiar with a lot of these crowdfunding platforms. Uh, seems like more and more are, are, are popping up every day. Some are more niche platforms where they they service a particular industry or, or type and some of them some of the bigger ones are, are more general and they can handle a lot of different types. Um, today we're going to be dealing with the crowdfunding basics and then we're going to talk about this money you raised, what's the character of it? We'll also talk about government compliance and then finally cash flow and why that's important for you. Um, so crowdfunding, initially a lot of people uh, share the, the idea that it started in 2003 with this Brian Camilio and uh, he was an artist and he was trying to help other people, other artists uh, really consolidate the fan base to help them produce more albums and more, more content. And so uh, really kicked off when this, uh, when Maria here, she garnered $130,000 to perform and to record this Concert in the Garden uh, record that she did. Uh, won Best Large Jazz Ensemble album and pretty much things took off from there. Indiegogo started up, Kickstarter started up, and now we have, I think it's up to over two billion has been raised from um, crowdfunding alone so far. Um, and we're just going to slide over these. I assume you probably know a substantial amount of crowdfunding already. So I'll just cover some basics. Um, there's four types of models. The first is uh, rewards based. And this is probably where you're more familiar with where um, you go on Kickstarter and you see a, a product that somebody wants to start and you donate or you, you contribute money for a reward. And sometimes that reward is the product, sometimes it's, uh, it's something else. And so um, most of these fund funding models are all or nothing. So you set a goal and you say, okay, I want to raise $50,000. If you don't raise that amount, you don't get anything. Even if you raise 48,000, you get nothing if you haven't hit your goal. Um, there are a few that have a, um, a keep it all, where if you raise 48, you keep 48, even if your goal is higher than that. But pretty much uh, most of them are all, all or nothing. Um, some of the more famous ones, Pebble, you may have heard about, uh, The Coolest Cooler, where they just have incredible growth and they raise all of this money. That, obviously those are the exceptions, uh, but they do happen. Um, What's important from a rewards-based crowdfunding standpoint is selling your dream. Uh, they found a lot of these crowdfunders, um, crowdfundees, the people that are making these donations, they will pledge less than the minimum amount. They don't get any reward at all, but they just believe in the dream that you're trying to sell. And that is critical. We'll come back to that a little bit later. Um, intellectual property, this is yours. You get to keep it for the most part. Um, it depends on the situation. Um, you also want to be careful of infringing on someone else's IP. And so if you're getting into more of a technical crowdfund, it might be worth your time to consult an IP lawyer and say, I've got this great idea. Is there someone else I might be infringing upon? Because you don't want to get started and then find out halfway through your campaign or even after your campaign, once you've spent money and taken money, that somebody else has already patented this idea and you can't continue. Um, they charge around a 5% fee of whatever you raise. And then there's specific categories. Um, some people are concerned about the fraud. What you need to know if you're going to be a crowdfunder is to make sure that you are transparent, that you, mainly where this comes up is where you promise something and you don't deliver. And there's been a few of these that have popped up in the, in the past. 
a recent past. Um, but people ba basically, they, they trust in the influence of the community. They trust that a lot of these people, they know this industry, they know that this, this type of crowdfund may or may not work. And by having that open communication, it um, hopefully discourages fraud. Um, some states in the FTC are, are now on, on their uh, horses trying to uh, you know, prevent this and they're starting to take disciplinary actions against what they see as fraudulent crowdfunders. Um, mainly these are people who take the money and run or that promise the world and then don't, don't, don't deliver anything. Um, we'll talk a little, little bit more about that also. Next item is debt-based. Next type is debt-based crowdfunding. And this is basically a loan. And um, a lot of times it's hard to walk down the street and get a loan at a bank. Um, if you've got good financial statements and if you've got a good idea, you can get loans from some of these other crowdfunding platforms. Um, they are attractive to lenders because they pay high interest rates and borrowers are simple and cheaper, but only about a 10% get approval rate. So it's not, every, not for everybody, but it is possible. Um, a lot is rewarded. It's a little bit more complex than a debt based than a rewards based crowdfund, and there are fees involved. And um, the good news is that insurance companies, pension funds, they see this as a good investment, and so this this industry is growing also. Um, donation based. This is your your charitable uh, crowdfunders, where you, like a GoFundMe, where you've got a, a a good cause. They're not getting anything in return. You're just saying this is a situation. Can you help us with it? Um, it's important if you're thinking of this that. Unless you get a 501c3 status from the IRS and you fill out form 1023, this is not a tax deduction for people who are donating to you. And that's critical that you make that known. Um, that also means that it's taxable to you as a crowdfunder. That's pretty straightforward. Equity-based crowdfunding is just something that this month just became legal. Um, this means that you can sell stock in your company to other people. This was prohibited earlier. Um, but a, a general solicitation was prohibited, meaning you couldn't go out and just say, hey, I'm starting this business, I want to sell my stock for X amount of, of dollars and give all the details. Um, this has been uh, outlawed since 1933 with the, invest, with, um, the Securities Act. It's basically trying to protect people from fraudulent investments. Uh, that has been redacted a little bit in 2012 and in this month, the regulations came forward finally that said, okay, you can, you can now start to equity crowdfund. Um, a lot of people are hesitant. We don't know a lot of the rules yet and how this will work. You basically have to be an accredited investor, which means you have to have annual income of over 200,000 or 300,000 if you're joint with a spouse, or you have to um, be worth a million dollars, in excess of a million dollars. So that's not what we're talking about here, but that's something that's, on the, on, that's here now and in the, in the future will probably take a, play a role in crowdfund. Um, so what we're going to focus on today is more rewards-based crowdfunding just because I think that's more typical. That's what people want, to, uh, that's what they see, that's what you, know, you, you typically think of when you think of crowdfunding. And so we're going to talk about the character of cash received. So if I start a, a crowdfunding campaign um, and I, I say, hey, I want to, I want to make a, 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 a teddy bear, a stuffed animal, and it's going to talk and it's going to move and it's going to be pretty cool. Um, people will donate money to that hopefully and then I receive that money if I reach my goal and so the, the idea now is at least from an IRS standpoint and from an accounting standpoint how do you characterize that money um, is it a loan is it a sale of equity a donation or income kind of what we talked about earlier it's not a loan if you don't pledge collateral or if you don't have some kind of uh, loan agreement in place and typically rewards based you're not selling equity you're not getting a loan it's not usually a donation it's almost always income and it's what we'll talk about is unearned income meaning you have received this money but you haven't earned it yet you haven't given them the product that they are essentially paying for and the IRS hasn't issued any regulations specific to crowdfunding yet and so this is still up in the air but this is the general consensus that we're operating on at this point um, the next thing we want to talk about is government compliance and this goes for any entrepreneur, anyone who's starting a business, any startup, is going to have to deal with these complications. And it's not any different for a crowdfunder just because you're doing it online or just because you're using Kickstarter or Indiegogo. And so this is a, a short list of things that you will need to comply with in order to run your business successfully and legally. Uh, you'll need a business license in the city you're operating in, in every city you're operating in. Um, you'll need a state 
business registration, wherever, whatever state you're operating in, you need to be registered in that state. You'll need to pay sales tax. Um, well, uh, potentially a reseller exemption certification, which um, to put it broadly, if, uh, if I am buying product from, what's your name? Uh, Corey. Corey? Corey. Corey? If Corey is selling me wood and I'm making desks, Corey is going to say to me, hey, I have to charge you sales tax for this. And I'm going to be buying these wood and I'm going to be making desks and selling it to somebody else, a, th a third party. And so what the state says is that, Corey, this is a sale in state, so you have to collect sales tax from everyone you sell wood to. And when I come to you and I buy your wood, you say, hey, pay me the sales tax on this. I can get a reseller exemption certificate to say, hey, I'm exempt from a sales tax because I'm actually going to sell it to somebody else and I'll collect sales tax on my, on my end. And so I give you that certificate and that way when the state comes to audit you for, re for sales tax, you can say, this is all the sales tax I've collected. And when the state says, hey, you didn't collect it from John when he bought that wood from you, you can say, oh, here's his resale exemption certificate. Go to him to pick up the sales tax on this wood that he sold to a third party when he made the desks, if that makes sense. And so these are important because you, you don't have to put up the money up front and you collect it from the, from the person on the back end. Um, from a different perspective, sales tax is in-state only. And this, this creates a unique issue for crowdfunders because if I, am, if I am crowdfunding on a website, I might say, hey, this is, make a $25 donation and you get this reward. Or make a $50 donation and you get this reward. And most crowdfundees do not like to have sales tax tacked on to the donation they feel they're already giving you. And so what you need to do is take this into account. Uh, when you buy something at a store, you obviously see that bottom line that says sales tax that's added. And you understand that that's part of the price. As, a, as a, uh, a crowd funder, you'll need to take that into account when you set that initial $25, $50 limitation and know that you are on the hook for some of the sales tax that might result from that. Um, and just hit, we'll hit sales tax right now um, because when, you, when you're receiving your donations, you need to keep track of zip codes, of addresses of, from all these donations you're receiving. Um, you're typically only responsible for sales in your state, in Virginia and everywhere else you won't have to pay that sales tax. Um, technically they will pay it, they should pay it on their end if they live out of state. Um, there's a place on even on your tax return where you can, you can pay that extra money. Um, technically you should be doing that now with your Amazon purchases that you're purchasing online. You will pay that sales tax to the Virginia separately from that transaction. Um, so that's one thing you take, take into account when you're setting your budgets. Um, you'll need a federal EIN number which is for the IRS, so you can file your tax return. Um, there's also a, a, an item called B poll tax, and we'll get into a little bit later, but that's a city tax that's in the Virginia that uh, is a little burdensome, that, that can be a little tricky. You might need insurance, um, payroll withholding and filing. If you have employees, you'll need to start paying payroll tax. Uh, state and federal income tax returns um, for your business if you're incorporated, and also for you personally and then making any estimated payments for it that you individually will need to make. So there's a lot of compliance issues that you need to be careful with. And this is generally where we see people get hung up because they can crowdfund, they can sell their, their, their story, and they can you know, sometimes even have their operations in place where if they make a lot of money quickly, they can get that, that production line moving. Where they get tripped up is with the government. And as we know, Caesar will, will get his due, right? He will always come to you and he will get what he is owed. Um, and so we want to make sure that we have all of our T's crossed and, and I's dotted on, on our compliance issues. Um, and then finally, cash flow. And um, this is the other, it, this goes hand in hand with government compliance because if your cash flow isn't correct, you can't, it can really hang up a lot of your operations. And the compliance issue gets tied up with cash flow as we'll see in a little bit. Um, but first of all, when you, you'll need to know what your expenses are when you set your projections. Um, this starts way before you put something, a, campa comp a campaign online. You will need to uh, itemize what your expenses will be, what your label will be, what your material costs and everything will go down the line. And some of those things you need to take into account besides your operational expenses are your crowdfunding fees. So Kickstarter, Indiegogo, they're gonna take 5% off the top. Um, there's usually a three to 5% 
that is taken by the, the processing company. Right now, uh, uh, Kickstarter used to use Amazon Payments, and now they're using a, a, um, a firm called Striper. But that's three to five percent. So off the top, you're taking ten percent um, of your of your fees. Then you have your reward costs. What did you promise for your rewards? Is it just the product or is it something else? Um, I recommend typically if you have a reward that it be as cheap as possible, obviously. But you want to make sure that when, you know, when you're promising your rewards that after your fees and after your operational expenses and after your rewards that you have something left over so you can actually fulfill on the promise that you're making when you, when you started your crowdfund campaign. Um, and so a lot of the, there's been some clever ideas out there. If, if, if you uh, want a couple, you can find out. One of my favorites was a man who um, he wanted to build a barn for his goats. And so he said, hey, I'm going to build this barn. It'll be a great thing. And the reward was that he would name one of his goats after you if you crowdfunded to his campaign. And obviously that's free. Um, he, sent, he would send a picture of the goat and a little write-up or something. And obviously that's very easy to comply with. It doesn't cost hardly anything and so um, it's a great way to give something back make them feel like they have a reward but also you're not taking a lot of expenses on board other common things are t-shirts or mugs and things like that um, if you can get them cheap and you can still fulfill in your crowdfunding promise then that works too um, taxes we'll get to on the next slide um, but they tend to cut into the bottom a lot um, and then when will you be paid this is really important because Usually on the keep it um, on the all or nothing campaigns, you will have a time frame, and you'll you'll set an end date, and you'll say, okay, by October 30th, I need to make this money. If I get it, if I do that, then I keep the money. Typically, if you make your goal, um, the payment will come about 14 days later, and so you'll have that that payment, and you'll be ready for it. Um, what we we strongly suggest is that campaigns for crowdfunding start early in the year. You don't want to have a campaign end in November or December. Um, because for tax purposes, that income is included on your tax return, say, say I started a campaign in 2015. And if it ends in December 2015, I get all of that money and that's, that's to my entity. And then say I don't start production until mid-January 2016. What that is on my tax return is it says, you reported all this income that you received in 2015 and I don't have any deductions to offset that income. And so I'm paying full freight on all of that income and that's re that really cuts into the operating capital you have to then go into your operating businesses. And this is a, one of the number one issues that really trip up a lot of crowdfunders. They, they, even if they do all their due diligence and they've got everything on board, if you end in no November, December, it's really hard to, have to, to make sure you get your expenses before that year end to offset that income. Um, and then with the tax rates now as they are, if if you receive a million dollars in your crowdfund and you're in the top bracket, you could be looking at 40, 45% of taxes that you're paying on that crowdfund money and effectively cuts in half everything that you have to move forward and, and, and pursue your campaign goal. And so um, you want to time it ideally February, March, April, where you've got these crowdfunding, this crowdfunding money coming in, and you've got the rest of the year to rack up expenses, to use your operating costs. Um, pay state taxes, which can be deductible, uh, get your crowdfunding fees in there also, so that you have a lot of deductions on that line, so at the end of the year, you're actually reporting uh, your income that you're actually realizing. And so that, that's pretty critical. Um, getting to taxes a little bit more. At the city level in Virginia, they have this uh, B poll tax, and that's a business tax on all gross receipts. It's a little different from an income tax because as we were just talking about an income tax you'll have your deductions and your exemptions and you'll get credits and and at the end of the day you have a taxable income and then you're taxed on on that amount with a b-pole tax there are no deductions and no exemptions it's on ev all of your revenue without deductions and it's 15 to 58 uh, cents per hundred dollars and it depends on what kind of industry you're in if you're in manufacturing or retail um, those percentages vary uh, but this is a, it's been considered a bane by every vi Virginia business owner for a long time. It started around the time of the Civil War. It was supposed to go away right after the war ended, and it's hung around for uh, quite a while. So they're still trying to find ways to get rid of this tax, but it, it's a big fundraiser for the cities, obviously Virginia. And so uh, they haven't managed to get rid of it yet. And so you want to be aware of that. 
um, there are a lot of exemptions that you can use to get out of the beephole tax. And uh, those include, uh, say you're in Virginia Beach, and if, you're, if you have an operation in Virginia Beach and an operation in Norfolk, or you're delivering to Norfolk, Virginia Beach can't tax you on the, the uh, activities that you're, you're doing in, in Norfolk. And so it, it, it tends to vary. Also, we had a client who, a large client, and they are an international company. They're located here locally, and the city was trying to tax them on all of their gross receipts, but they drop shipped a lot of their, op a lot of their product and it never entered Virginia Beach and it was never shipped from or delivered to Virginia Beach. And there's an exemption in the Beepole guidelines that say you, that's not taxable for the, for the city. And so they, we were able to get them off on a, on a huge liability they were anticipating for Beepole tax because it would never entered the city. And so as you're planning your crowdfunding campaigns, if you can use that tool to say, hey, if I can drop ship this um, to New York and I can ship from there and it doesn't have to come into Virginia or even the city, it might save you quite a bit on the bee pole tax. And so um, we'll get into this a little bit later too, but it, that's why it's important to have a, a great team around you to help you understand these issues and help you um, get away from some of the pitfalls that you could otherwise fall in. Uh, state level taxes, we've got the, sale, the sales and use tax that we talked about. Um, it's 5.3 in Virginia. If you live in Northern Virginia or Hampton Roads, it's an extra 0.7, so you're paying 6% sales tax. So factor that in when you're making your crowdfund limitations. Uh, the other is your income, and this depends on how you're structured. Um, definitely recommend that you have some kind of legal entity to run your business through. Um, otherwise, you don't have any legal protection. So start an LLC is what we generally recommend. You could start an S corporation or a C corporation. Um, the difference is we can, we can go over it at a different time, uh, but almost always we recommend an LLC. Um, if, that, if you there are two more people in that LLC, it will be taxed as a partnership. If there's only one of you, it can, be, uh, it can be a sole proprietorship, which means you don't have to file another tax return. It can just be placed on, the, on your personal tax return as a Schedule C, um, and that's an option also. Um, but just know that you've got your income that will be flowing through to you individually from your crowdfunding campaign. And so if, you, if your crowdfund shows $15,000 of income, that will flow through to you individually and appear on your tax return, and you'll have to pay tax on that amount. Um, same thing happens at the federal level, and this all depends on what tax bracket you're going to be in, uh, but the same thing happens and you'll pay tax on the income that you receive. Uh, another item that trips up a lot of first-time business owners and especially crowdfunders is your estimated payments. So right now, if you are working for a, a company, you get a W-2, and the company withholds all of your, your taxes, your state taxes, your federal taxes are required to and they submit those on your behalf and then when you file your tax return at the end of the year, those items appear at the bottom of your tax return as deductions for you. you you've already paid in that tax, not deductions, but a prepaid tax basically. And that's subtracted from your taxable income. Well, if you're not working for that company anymore and you are crowdfunding, none of that pre-tax is being deducted and submitted to the state. And so you're going to end up with a tax liability and the IRS says it's not okay to pay us at the end of the year. We want estimated payments because on a W-2, we get paid every two weeks by your employer or every, you know, bi-weekly or whatever the, bi-monthly, whatever the, the arrangement is. And they say, we don't want this at the end of the year. We want this periodically throughout the year. And so there are four quarters in the year. They want a payment pretty much every quarter. And so you want to build that into your projection for your crowdfunding campaign because you're going to know, I've got to make estimated payments. And the way it works is it's 90% of what you'll pay that year. So for 2016, if I start a crowdfunding campaign or, or, or a small business and I'm, I've got my own payments, I have to pay 90% of what my tax liability will be. Sometimes that's hard to say. I don't know what my tax liability is gonna be for 2016. If I'm, raising, if I'm, if I'm growing a business and, and things are moving and, and I could either lose a lot or I can make a lot, right? And so they say, there's another option. You can pay 110% of your prior year. And so I said, okay, I know what my prior year is. And so you can pay 110% over those four quarters for that year and you're, you're within that safe harbor. And um, if you wait to the end of the year to pay everything, there's interest and penalties that apply. And so when you're, when you're putting in your projections, you want to say, okay, what did I make last year on my W-2 job or my other business or what do I expect my income to be this year and build those into your projections so that you, you don't get tripped up on that. And then payroll. Uh, payroll, as you can see, is 7.465 percent basically if you've got uh, 
employees that you're paying. You don't have to pay yourself. You don't have to submit that payroll tax. Um, but if you have employees that you that you brought on and you're paying as a W-2, you'll need to submit this payroll tax. So, um, from a from a cash flow perspective, for taxes, you have expenses that are deductions. Normal expenses that you incur are deductible, fully deductible. There's what we call startup costs, though, and startup costs can be if you hire an attorney to uh, incorporate your business, or if you have any costs that happen before your first day of business, those are called startup costs. And you either have to capitalize those, which means you, for 15 years, you take a portion of that and you deduct it over 15 years, which isn't ideal. You can make an election to take the first $5,000 um, if you want. If it's over $50,000, then it, it's reduced. And those are more technical, but just to let you know, anything you spend before your business starts may not be a full deduction for you. Um, and then the taxes, as we mentioned, um, it can, they can, the time you can make it or break it for you. If, if you've got a crowd fund that, you, that you're operating and you're doing well with, but all of a sudden Uncle Sam comes knocking and says, you owe us this tax bill, that, takes, that will take a lot of your operating capital potentially, and then you wouldn't have the money going forward to fulfill your promises. Yes? How do they define when your business starts? Um, it's, it's a little amorphous, as you can imagine. Um, basically, what we tell our clients is if you are open for business, if you can, if, if someone take, you know, if they order your product or your service and you're able to deliver that product and service, you're open for business, you're active, and that's just a normal business expense. So, um, a lot of times, this startup cost will consist of attorney's fees, maybe a few accountant fees, um, hopefully, nothing major. Uh, because you want to lump everything into, you know, after you start, so you can take that deduction, obviously. So, um, and that, and then this is just kind of a summary before you start your campaign. Um, obviously, you want to understand the type of crowdfunding you're going to be attempting. Um, you'll need your goals, your costs, and your revenue proje projections. Um, you take into account all of these items that we've discussed, and then you want to plan your launch. Um, your first few days are vital. This is not the time to tell everybody for the first time that you're coming out and that you're ready to, to roll. Um, you want your pre-existing fans locked in and lined up ready to contribute. Uh, because what you're essentially doing is you're engaging your initial audience in order to gain access to a larger audience. So you want those, those faithfuls that you have to really rally around your product to bring it to the attention of the, of the larger crowdfunding community. And so they say, hey, a lot of people are interested in this. This sounds, sounds like a cool idea. And then you get more momentum gaining that way. Um, and then finally, you want your team of professionals on call. You want mentors, someone who maybe have done this, has done this before or is in your in industry or at least has some startup experience. Uh, you want a good attorney, a good accountant, other professionals that can help guide you through this process to hopefully miss some of these uh, these pitfalls that a lot of people fall into and uh, it, it could mean the, the, the difference of, a, of your business succeeding or failing depending on how serious you, these pitfalls are. So um, that's all the information I had. Do you have any questions? Kind of covered a lot very broadly. Um, from our experience I think it's really important to uh, understand and plan ahead. At this point, you know, we're in May, June, uh, for 2016, I'd almost say it might be too late to start a, a crowdfunding campaign this year. Uh, it takes a good six months to get things under your belt and rolling all the people in the right place on the bus so that hopefully starting 2017, you can start with the campaign, you have your costs in place, you have your, your, your platform ready to go. Um, but just know it's not, it's not like posting on Facebook. It's not uh, something flippant that sometimes I think people do. And really there are some, some major uh, there can be some major consequences if, if you do it wrong. So, um, yes? Do you, excuse me, I know there are a ton of crowdfunding sites. Do you have some that you would recommend, you know, are there certain ones that you recommend for nonprofits, certain ones for businesses? Yeah, it definitely depends on what, what kind of, what your target is. If it's a nonprofit, there are nonprofit, uh, like the, the GoFundMe, yeah, there right. are. Okay. And um, I would recommend those. If it's a general thing you're going for, especially rewards-based, I generally recommend some of the big ones like Kickstarter, Indiegogo, just because they have a larger audience, a, a broader base to pull from. Um, but there are some really good uh, nonprofit platforms that pull a lot of people. Um, 
But uh, yeah, if you're interested in that, also you might want to consider going for a 501c3 status because that, once people know that their tax deduction, their their investment could be a tax deductible, obviously that's a that's a very attractive. So. There's, I'm sorry. There's actually people that kind of they might have just found these things and they'll contribute to it. That kind of blows my mind. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's not just your audience. It, it, it's got reach beyond your own audience. It can. Yeah. That's why your story is so important. That's why you never do a crowdfunding campaign without a video, a really good video, because that's what sells your story to people and it helps them understand, you know, and get behind your idea. Uh, yeah, it blew my mind too to know that people are just giving money essentially. Um, uh, and so it, there's a lot of, there's been a lot of development in, in how this money, what it, what it means, because we have a lot of people saying, um, well, I'm buying this product and, and, you know, Amazon Prime delivers in two days why isn't my product here it's been two months and so it, you know you're not buying the product you are you are investing and you get a reward for your product typically and uh, it's a little easier from the nonprofit standpoint because it is a donation they understand that up front and uh, so it's even more important to sell your story for a campaign like that so is yeah. there a rule of thumb like percentage of um, you know, you're basically giving away eight percent to company plus payment processing so that leaves you with somewhere you know, north of 90%. Right. Um, is there a good rule of thumb of what percentage of that your margin should be to actually put towards the project that you see? Um, because sometimes, you know, you have 100 t-shirts that cost you $1,000, you raise $1,000, you're out. Is there, is there a kind of number that you've seen that is a good rule of thumb for people to try and shoot for as a kind of medium? It's, it's hard to have a, a rule of thumb just because everything is different. It, reward, it depends on your rewards that you're offering. It depends on your tax bracket, really. If, if I'm used to making $200,000 a year, my tax bracket's gonna be way higher, which means I'm gonna need a lot more money for my crowdfunding campaign to cover that cost going forward. Um, if I'm in a lower tax bracket, not so much. So it could be anywhere from 40% you know, you, you take 60% after that for your crowdfunding campaign because 40% is going to be wrapped up in everything else. Um, but it could be lower, more like 25% potentially, depending on your tax bracket and your rewards and some other things going into it. So, yeah, I'm sorry. Not, not a rule of thumb that I've seen so far. So, yeah. Um, <clears throat> how much should a, uh, a company or a person expect to invest to have a successful uh, campaign? Again, that depends on what you're asking for. Um, but no matter what your ask is, most investors, whether they're professional investors, accredited investors, or just the crowd, they want to see that you have some skin in the game. And so you, you want to make that known that, hey, I'm investing a substantial amount, or I'm uh, investing X amount of money, or I'm willing to invest this amount of time. Uh, because if they don't see you willing to sacrifice and make that, that uh, commitment, they're not going to be too inclined to give you their money. And so, not a rule of thumb. Um, for general startups, it's nice if you can have <coughs> a substantial amount up front to say, hey, I'm willing to fund 10% or 20%, even 5% of this, of this entity, of this uh, project or uh, this dream. And can you help me with the rest of it? So, definitely have some skin in the game. It depends on the volume that you're looking for probably though. So, yeah. Uh, when it comes to um, the taxes part, uh, where do you go to find out like how our tax system works and all the different taxes that you have to pay in order to you know start your business? Good question. Um, I think incubators like Hatch are a great a great starting point because they can at least put you in touch with professionals that that can help you. They probably they might have some products or some some resources for you to avail yourself of. Um, Really, the internet is a great resource. There are a lot of professionals who post information for free online to help kind of walk you through. And uh, the majority of them are saying, hey, this is what you need to know, and then if you need to know more, come contact me and I, you know, I'll help you. Um, but really a lot of research on your part will we'll do a lot. If you, as far as the city and the state taxes, um, you can call up those departments and you can say, hey, this is my situation. Um, I know I need to file this tax. Can you give me some, some information? And you might have to read some boring tax forms and you might have to listen to somebody. Um, the IRS probably isn't going to do that for you. Um, you'll probably have to wait for an hour just to talk to somebody uh, and, and they're not gonna give you that kind of advice. Um, but there are a lot of tax professionals and legal 
consultants, even in Hampton Roads that I'm aware of, that if you have a great idea and if you can sell your, your dream, they'll be willing to invest some time in you pro bono to help you get off the ground. Um, either because they like your idea and they want to support it, or they feel like your idea is going to be successful and they want you as a client in a couple of years when you're doing well and uh, they want to bring you on board there. So um, there's, there's some people in the area you could talk to. Internet's a good source. And then the, if you can get a hold of anyone that actually enforces those tax at those agencies, um, that they're obviously great resources too. So, yeah. Anything else? All right. Thank you.